and let us go into the house of the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continuously be in my mouth. I am deaf to both to the Greek and to the unwise, to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, for as much as in me is. I am ready to preach the gospel to you, as Paul said, at Rome, but here in Columbus, Georgia, at Casita Road, Church of Christ. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Truly we are grateful to the Almighty God for his traveling grace, for blessing us to assemble again in this place where the Church of Christ meets here on Casita Road. We thank you, one and all, Brother Glasgow, for the invite, for the eldership, the leadership, and the membership. Appreciate much. Brother Glasgow will recognize you at the appropriate time, but I thank you. And I will go ahead and fix it so he always mess up this. We bring you greetings from the biggest, littlest church in East Alabama and West Georgia, where everybody is indeed somebody. Don't let Brother Glasgow touch it here, mess it up. But we thank him for the invitation. If you have your Bibles, be turning with us to Judges. The backdrop will be chapter 10. The lesson itself will take off in chapter 11 and the first seven verses of chapter 12. Judges, chapter 10. That's right after Joshua, just before 1 Samuel. If you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not there, say wait. Now, I can't keep waiting. Brother Glasgow gave me a time limit. If you would, though, study along with us this evening. We thank you so very much because, as Paul said to the church in Rome, chapter 15, the verses 4, that which was written aforetime full time was written for our learning. This passage compels you and I to open up the book of God, go back and read and study the Old Testament. There are some valuable lessons back there. One of my uh, subtopics from uh, Yepta, uh, some say Jepta, Yepta, the judge, be careful, little tongue, what you say. Be careful, big mouth, what comes out. You need to understand and realize and know you are going to be held accountable. And there are a lot of lessons coming from this particular judge. And we hope and pray to get there. The backdrop, though, I want to give you a couple of points. The backdrop, my outline itself. I have six points from the uh, lesson verses of chapter 11 and the first seven verses of chapter 12. But from verse number 6 in Judges 10 through verse number 18, there is a great lesson there. Because sometimes you and I don't understand when you are living a life up and down, down and up, there is no consistency. Every time you want to do something good, you know, the devil is in you, uh, in us, and, and he'll make you do something bad. Well, the children of Israel had taken on that facade. They had came right back to where they were, and verse number 6 of Judges 10 lets you and I know the devil began to get in God's folks again. They forgot God, and as a result of forgetting God, it made God hot, excuse that phrase, but God became very, very angry. And as a result of becoming angry, they cried, they cried to the Lord because God told them, right now, you've turned your back on me, you stop worshiping and serving me, and they go out here, and these here Ammonites, Philistines, put a whooping on them. And when they put a whooping on them by 18 years, they start hollering for God. God told them, I have rescued you in time past. But guess what, church? He said, I'm not going to do it now. You know, that looked like some of us. Every time you get in trouble, who you call on? How many of you call on the devil? 
You want to call on God every time you expect for God to rescue you. But it's going to come a time in your life where you're going to call on God and he's going to do us the way he do the children of Israel in, in chapter 10. He's going to say, go and ask the gods that you serve to come here and answer your prayers. False gods come from man. God Almighty take care of his children. And that's one of the things you and I got to understand. I want to... There's a thought here uh, found in verse number 10 through 16 in Judges 10. We cry for help, me being we, the Israelite, cry for help. And this is a picture calling on God in times of emergency. You know what that means? You only call on God when you need him. But God said no. And when they got through putting on him, you know what they said? Just like us. Lord, I'm sorry. And God knew the first time they repented that they were lying. He knew that. Let me just drop this off while I'm flying. I, I hope I can get to this point. Confession without repentance don't work in God's sight. If you are not going to truly turn and repent, hush. The another lesson is about running off at the mouth, that rash talking. This is what happened. When you and I got in so much trouble back here and before Jephthah took the throne or was coming up because this is a background before he is chosen by God. This was a man that was rejected, kicked out of his own family house, but he was chosen by God. You know the great thing about this lesson? God don't look at no popular uh, 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 person or uh, noted person to use them. God always used the humble. That's a blessing. God knows our hearts and minds, don't he? The last point I want to make, taken from verse 17 and 18, is where the leadership? <clears throat> Hello. When you get over to chapter 11 and start reading, you start looking at the elders of Gilead, and they come there and they are asking Jephthah to come here and become our leader. My problem is this. Where are your leaders? When you go back and look at verse number 17 and 18 of Judges chapter 10, you'll find out that all them people had kicked Jephthah out. He had fled to the land of Tar, and now they go and ask him, come over here and help us. And he's going to turn around and tell them, then you kick me out your city. I want you to know that this is a great lesson to some of us. The greatest point is that if you do not have qualified leadership to stand in the gap for God, folks, my, mm-mm. A lack of leadership will put us in a predicament. Let me just qualify that. It must be qualified leadership. Because everybody can't be no leader. Some of them, we don't want le <clears throat> leaders. Mm-hmm, y'all ain't got to say amen, pat your toe. When you and I get so corrupt and we start doing things very, very bad and we leave God, there is no one left but the devil. And when you and I start serving the devil, next thing you know, the devil will infiltrate our hearts and our minds and we out there and that's exactly what happened in verses number six all the way down through verse number 18 of Judges 10. The people forsook God. They left him. They went back and as a result, God let them go back to their old devilish way. Y'all know anybody like that around Columbus? Huh? Now y'all know we're members of the Lord's house. We're members of the Church of Christ. The only blood bought institution in the world. But sometimes a lot of our folks come up in here with the wrong expectation. They come up in here and they obey the gospel as if they're just going to slide right on into heaven. You're going to catch H as being a child of God. That's the devil's number one job. And stop looking at telling by people, well, the devil made me do the hell. No, 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 no. The devil didn't make you do anything. You wanted to do it. You use the devil as an excuse. But the devil infiltrates all of our hearts and our minds. And the things that you know you ought to do according to God's word, you don't. Why? Because you don't have God's word in you. The lesson that we have before us this evening, Yepta, 
the judge. Teach us a valuable lesson. Be careful how you treat one another. The very first thing that I've seen in this particular lesson after I was assigned it was that when you are outcast, and let's say it happened that you had the same daddy but different mamas, and all of a sudden, if y'all were my children and y'all thought I had some money, and I had some children by this one and had some by this one and only a few over here and a heap over there. What do you think them heap going to do to them few when I die? You ain't getting none of my money. That's what they did to Yepta. They kicked him out of his own house because Gilead being the daddy, Yepta's mother was a prostitute. Name not mentioned. Nothing else is mentioned about her. But the lesson that we have from the very outset, it shows an attitude of greed. You don't think your own folks will stab you in the back? Let somebody close to you die. That's a lesson one. I know y'all talk about, I mean, amen. I want to see this here. The one that opened up his, his mouth and he made a vow, as Brother Glasgow said, when he made a vow, you make sure you keep the Bible, teach me in the book of Deuteronomy and also in the book of Numbers, when thou shalt vow, a vow unto the Lord, thou shalt not slack to pay it for the Lord God will require it of thee. Then he tells them in Numbers 30, don't break your word. One thing you and I in the Church of Christ are noted for, should be, Honest, trustworthy. When you say you're going to do something, do it. You all do know when you came out the water of the grave of baptism, y'all made a vow to God, don't you? Y'all say amen. You made a promise to God. I'm going to be faithful unto death. And the first thing somebody step on your toe, you come up in church, somebody might be sitting in your own seat, and you cop an attitude, and out the door you go. That's another lesson. I want to drop this off. In Deuteronomy 23, verse number 21 through 23, there was a phrase in there that I would hope you, write these scriptures down, please, ma'am, please, sir. Go back home and read and study them. Ponder over them. Get the lesson that we are being taught from the Old Testament. These intriguing lessons will share with us when you and I open up our mouth and we say we're going to do something, do it. You ain't got to worry about nobody else holding you accountable. God knows. Listen at Moses in Deuteronomy 23. Right in the middle, after I just finished saying, uh, it will be sin, but the Lord God will require it of thee. What, Matt? that vow that you made, and then it would be sin to thee. So therefore, it's a sin if you make a vow and don't keep it. But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. Watch this now. That which gone out of thy lips, out your lips, every time you and I open that split under our nose, be careful what comes out. You're going to give an account for that. He said, Thou which is gone out of thy lips, thou shalt keep and perform even a free will offering, according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. Be careful what come out your little mouth. Hmm. I'm going on pretty much left and I'm going to Point number, let me, let me give you my points, just in case I... Don't make it. I got six points from chapter 12, chapter 11 through chapter number 12. Six points, and I know I ain't going to get to them, but I'm going to do the best I can. How about that? There's a picture of greed. There's a picture of being rejected by us for being called by God. There's a picture of seeking peace. Yep, Jephthah was a peacemaker. He was a, a political foe. He was one that knew how to work the system in God's sight, not, not ours. There's a picture of a spiritual power and victory, a picture of the importance of 
of vows. And then in chapter 12, there's a picture of pride and jealousy. In chapter 11, Jephthah was the judge. He was a little, mm, tight on Matt, uh, even before I get to chapter 12, illegitimate child in the sight of man, but was chosen by God to deliver his folks. If I could wind it up there, Brother Glasgow, and extend the invitation, you got your lesson. But let me, let me run down through this here as fast as I possibly can. Greed, the rejection and exile of Jephthah by his brothers. Because they did not want him to share in their father's inheritance, they kicked him out. When Gilead died, they said, you cannot share this. Your mother is a strange woman. Get out. His own family. Don't be surprised if that happened to you. Now, when he left, God knew what was happening. He became a mighty warrior, a strong leader, and word, he became noted among those same folks. Now, here it is. I'm going back to chapter 10 now. At the end of chapter 10, when the leaders began to look for a man that would lead them, because the Ammonite and the Philistine was getting ready to bring war upon them, and they didn't have nobody to lead them. My problem is this here. Where was the leadership? God needs some strong, qualified men to lead his folks. They couldn't find none among their own folk. So guess what they had to do? As some of us would say in our terminology today, they had to eat crow. They had to go back and ask the one that they had cast out and rejected to come back and take care of them. You know, I like what, <laughs> I don't know if we can be like Jephthah. Because somebody done cussed us out and beat us down and called us a dog and, I mean, done took everything from us and then turn around and come back and start asking us for a favor. Lord, we need your help now because I don't know if I'm going to be able to help you or not the way you did me because when it comes to being greedy, greed will run you crazy. You remember what Jesus said in Luke? Jesus said, take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possessed. Be careful of stuff. Leave it alone. You want something? Ask God. God said, okay, you can have it. God going to give you strength to go and get an honest job to make it. I believe that. The next point. Oh, y'all missed that one, didn't you? We crossed the river now. All my Alabama folk, don't make no stops. You work an honest job. God done gave us good, honest air. <clears throat> I heard on the news last night, Brother Glasgow, they said it jumped up to 185 million. It'll be rough for y'all to go out there and scratch that booger off and hit that 185 million and die. That's the power of the devil. The devil plants that thought in our mind, but you know you are doing exactly what the children of Israel did, and this is what is taught in verses number 6 through 18 in Judges 10. God allowed the same Israelites over and over again that he had kept rescuing. He's, he allowed them to go back and serve those same false gods the same way he do today. We come in here and say, I'm going to be a child of God, a faithful child of God, and next thing you know, you just leave, put, the, put God in the closet. Wrong. Verses number 4 through 11 in Judges 11 shows a picture of a rejected individual being called by God. The leaders of Israel made a strong appeal to Jephthah. Please come and help us. Please come and rescue us from the Ammonites. I like his attitude. Why are you coming and asking me to help you 
when you have done this to me. You know, when a person is in bad shape, when they say, if you'll come back and do this here for me, God's go, I'll give you anything you want. Y'all see that? It's in there. Whatever you need, you over all of us and get it at. He wasn't no fool enough to take that. He said, you mean to say that uh, you're going to do this? What makes you think I'm going to trust you after you did that to me? So they said, we'll go ahead and we'll make a vow in the sight of God, and we promise that we're going to do this for you. That's many times in our own lives when you and I are called to help and someone have done you real, 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 real bad. And if you want me to step into your house, all I got to do is say they ask you for some money, to borrow some money, a heap of money, and they promise to pay you that back, and they pass by you in a brand new car and got a brand new house and ain't paid you your $10 yet. It's a sad commentary. Be careful how you give it. Because as Paul said to the church in Galatia, what goes around comes around. You're going to reap what you sow. I like Jephthah's attitude in verse number 9 of uh, Judges 11. Because of his past experiences with those same folks, he doubted their honesty. And it's sad to say he had to request a guarantee. Now, you know it's bad when you and I make a promise or a vow and folk don't trust us. That ought not ever happen to a child of God because your word is your bond. Oh, mercy. Y'all do believe that, don't you? You know what would be great if you wanted a brand new car, go down there to the deal and just tell the man, I want this 2020 and I'm going to pay you on time. And don't put your old name on the dotted line. How many of you think you're going to get that car? Mm-hmm, you're right. <laughs> One of the things that happened here is that we have to understand, when you and I make a vow or we say we're going to do something, I hope and pray that we have entrusted our lives to that person and they can trust us to keep our word. That's point number two, being rejected. Now we have a peacemaker. After Jephthah accept the challenge, there's a scene of diplomacy. He begins to go back after he see that the Ammonite king, they're fixing to attack them. He goes back there and began to appeal to them, what have I done to you, man? And this joker bring up stuff from when the Israelites came out of Egypt. Of course, I'm going to fast forward this now. When Jephthah got through and he rejected, he got all of the Israelites, those that was with him, all the men that fight, and went up there and wiped them out. Kicked them good. And then took the land. But I want you to look at a point here. He was a peacemaker before he started war. How many of us are peacemakers when it comes to problems and we try to resolve them? Are we peacemakers or H <clears throat> or razors? We are to strive for peace. And let me drop this off to us in the Church of Christ while flying over this area. I can't stand Elliot Glasgow. I told Sister Avis, bless her heart, y'all pray for her. I told her she had a husband that was one of my dearest friends. Amen. I don't have a lot of them, but he's one of my dearest friends, and he and I can talk about one another, and we talk to one another and call each other out of some bad names, and we still are friends. But we also understand peacemaking 
is on my part. I hear Paul saying to the church in Rome, as much as lied within live peaceable with everybody except for Ellie Glasgow. <laughs> A lot of us right now don't understand that we say we're going to live peaceful with everybody except. And when Paul wrote that to the church in Rome, that was some hard meat until we mature to that stage. Jephthah had four points, four arguments in verses number 12 through 28. The first argument was historical, going all the way back to Egypt. The second argument was a theological argument. He declared that it was the Lord himself that had gave the land to Israel. Uh, they didn't just jump up and take it. God had already promised that. That was a third argument, which was a legal statement. Jephthah declared that Moab the king, Balak, was even forced to, uh, to claim Israel. And the fourth argument there was a personal argument. He said, what I done did to you that you want to bring war upon me? Flip the script and beat them down. You'll see that in verses 12 through 28. The argument for negotiation failed. We don't understand that war bring about tragedy. War hurt people. It splits family, call families, all kind of peace. But I hear Jesus saying, Matthew 5, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Paul still said, If it be possible, Mac, you need to elaborate just one thirty second on that. Sometimes it ain't possible. And if it ain't possible, leave their presence. Because if you don't, the devil will pull you to his level. Now, y'all got a problem with that. Take it up with the Lord. Yeah. I like Paul also said in Romans 14, let us therefore follow after things which make for peace. This is to Casita Road and March. And things wherewith one may edify not tear down, edify, not talk about, edify one another. Romans 14, 19. Oh, don't got quiet around here. I'm running on good time too, Elliot. There's a fourth point. Picture of power and victory. This is leading up to where we, everybody been talking about now. When he began to go to war, he never claimed the victory for himself. He said, it come from God. God is the one that gave me the power. There is a spiritual victory as well as a physical victory. The Ammonites were defeated by Israel. And this great victory given to Jephthah and the Israelite, it shows the spiritual power and victory every time we depend on God and not on one another. You and I are going through a war each and every day of our lives. If you got up this morning and said, Lord, help me and lead me through the day. Don't get up and say, I wonder what I'm going to do today. I need to do this here. I need to do that. And, and then maybe about 12, 30, 1 o'clock, oh, by the way, I need to thank God and ask him to help. The first thing we ought to be doing is asking God. These are life lessons from the life of Jephthah. He made preparation to fight. He made a special vow. And I will not get into this because so much talk has been talked about by all of these here great elaborators, all of these great uh, philosophers about did he keep the vow? Did he kill his dog? My only comment to you there is read and study your Bible. Well, better yet, ask Brother Glasgow. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me hurry. Point number four. This power that we have to understand, 
God gave the Israelites a stunning victory. I'm talking about he beat them down so bad till you know what? When you kill that many thousands of folks with what God have gave you, Jephthah never turned around and said, look what I did, y'all. This is me. He gave God the honor. Always giving God the honor. Victory over all of the enemies, those who oppose us. Sometimes we don't understand. There are physical enemies that get you and I every day. Right around here in Columbus, Georgia, in Smith Station, Alabama, in Valley, Alabama, it's called addiction to alcohol or drug. Gluttony, greed, poverty, loss of a loved one, grief and despair, loneliness, depression, emptiness. These are diseases that get us and bring us down. We need God's help. There is no limit to the list of enemies who oppose us. If you don't believe me, I can count the number of churches when I came around the corner there by Lance, all the way down. I didn't go all the way down, but I do know up in Valley, where I live, uh, in that little small uh, little city, there are 127 different denominational churches and only three Church of Christ. I didn't count the number going up and down the road right here, but these are enemies. When people tell you you can go to the church of your choice, you ought to be just like Jephthah and have the guts and ask them, show me book, chapter, and verse where God said you can go to the church of your choice. Hmm? Take a stand. If we're going to remember one thing, victory is always on God's side. It's the Lord and him alone who give us the power to walk through and conquer you know, you know who the devil scared of? The Lord. Yeah. And he, you know something else? Whenever you take God's word and put it in you, yeah. the devil becomes scared of you. Yeah. But the devil knows that sooner or later you're going to get tired of reading and study. You're going to get tired of going to Bible class. You're going to get tired of all these here elders and preaching and everybody hitting on your door saying, where you been? Or where you at? The devil said, just go ahead and take a break. The devil said, take a vacation. I'll just drop this off. Don't play with the devil. He's out of our league. Keep God's word in you. Paul asked this question in Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who? And he give you a long list, and then he get all the way down and said, No height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then I like what he said, There have no temptation taken you, but as such as is common to man. I'm here to tell you, God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are tempted above with the same temptation. Make a way for you to escape that you might be able to bear it. We got to deliver. Look, I don't know about y'all, but I know I can learn this lesson looking at him. This was an outcast. Some might say the scum of the earth, but God took care of him. Point number five, the importance of vows. It is best to look at the scripture and read the scripture outline and conclude the answer to yourself. I will say a few observations that many, many of these profound scholars, if Jephthah sacrificed his daughter, as he said, he vowed this, if God would give him victory over the Ammonites when he came back, that which came out. Matter of fact, y'all got your Bible. Turn to Judges 11. This is, we just need to let God's word speak for itself. Amen, lights. As they said, don't put Cooper right in the middle of nothing. My job is to be God's mailman tonight. Verse number 31, Judges 11. Y'all got it? This is the vow. Verse number 30, Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be, is that in your Bibles, that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, surely shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Is that in your Bibles? 
according to the book of Leviticus. And also, we also know there are other scriptures in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy 23 that God have also said, if you, you cannot offer a human as a sacrifice to him, he do not accept that. If it was an animal, offer it. But the hero in my little, little, little bit of uh, brain is the daughter. When he came back and she came out with the tim timbrels and dancing, giving praise to him for the victory. And I know if that had been me, my only child, Glasgow Bell wouldn't have had to say that. I would have just went under the ground. The scripture said he had no other sons and daughters except for her. And when she came out, he said, oh, Lord, you done did me. His only, now y'all listen at it. He's a judge. But after her, there is no legacy for Jephthah. He had no one to carry on his name. But look at what she suggests. Daddy, whatever it is that you have vowed to the Lord, keep it. She said, if thou hast opened thy mouth, if thou hast opened thy mouth, that's verse 36, if thou hast opened thy mouth and out of thy mouth came that vow, she said, keep it. According to that which thou has proceeded out of thy mouth, for as much as the Lord have taken vengeance for, the, for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. And she asked this request. One thing, leave me alone for two months. Let me go up to the mountains and beware of my virginity. Took with her, her companions, uh, the young ladies with her. Two months. After two months, she came back. And the scripture says this. Now watch this. If she was sacrificed, as some folks proclaim, why did the writer say at the end of verse number 39, excuse me, end of uh, verse number, yeah, end of verse number 39, and she knew no man. Y'all remember Anna? Servitude to the Lord. Every year, the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament, praise, celebrate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. What you don't understand is that what you say can come back to get you. Be careful what comes out of your mouth. I'm going to give you this last outline. I'm not going to be able to get to it. But I want you all to look at something real. Verses 1 through 7 of Judges 12. You know what happens a lot of times when you go out here and you hit these doors up and down because see the road or through Columbus and all of a sudden the victory is yours or people began to come in and the Church of Christ is enlarged day by day down here and you got these other rascals that's sitting over yonder by birth turning them. They're dying through that way. They're just looking. All of a sudden, they become envious and pride. They get jealous over the work you've done. And then they want to come up here and say, well, how come y'all didn't call me, Lewis, and say y'all going to hit on those sad? You've been saying it all year. The Ephraimites came and started fussing with him as to why he didn't come and ask them to go fight. He did. But there's also something else in there. Sometimes you can't talk plain. And I'm going to leave that with you. Read those verses and see how many of those children of Ephraim were killed for not being able to say Shibboleth. The lesson is yours.
Jephthah judged six years and died. And notice this fact. He was buried in one of the cities. It don't even specify which one. But he was a great judge. He taught us a valuable lesson. He taught us real quick, doesn't, don't matter what the circumstances is from your life, keep looking to God. It don't matter how bad folks treat you, even if they're in your own house, keep looking to God. It don't matter sometimes when you run off at the mouth, keep your word. You and I made a vow to God a long time ago. We said, Lord, I want my mansion, my robe, and my crown. God said, okay, if that's what you want, then these are the conditions. After you've heard and believed the facts and obeyed the command by repenting, confessing, and being baptized in water, now you must live faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. That's God's promise. In order to receive it, we must remain faithful. We promised him. So therefore, when you and I stand before God at judgment, wait for the Lord to say, come ye blessed. And he said another three words. Go to. You won't be surprised. If you're not yet in Christ, we bid you to do that. You are living beneath your privileges. If you open your Bibles and study your Bible, it's only one that you and I must be in. And I put it this way, you must be married to Christ. Paul says to the church of Corinth, I espouse you to one husband. Therefore, when you get married to Christ, you and I become the bride of Christ, and we are Christ's wife. Therefore, we ain't got no business cutting out on him, going with somebody else. You've got to be faithful to your one husband, and as a result, you will hear him say, well done, when he come back to get us. Brothers and sisters, don't take a chance with your soul. If you have said something that you know it was in error, be man enough, be woman enough to say I'm sorry. Repent of it. But let me just drop this off. When you read and study Judges chapter 10 all the way through Judges 12, you will notice one thing about those Israelites. When they turn around and told God, do to us whatever you need to, the scripture says that the same false God, some of us who, who, who got false gods right here, they took him and threw him away. Got rid of everything they was worshiping. And said, I'm coming home. How about you? If you are in sin, you need to repent. Luke 13, 3 and 5. Confess with your mouth what you believe in the heart of your mind. Matthew 10, 32. Romans 10, 9 and 10. And be buried in the water where you contact the shed blood of Christ in the water and you come up as a new creation. God adds you to his family his church, and guess what? God don't have but one house. All God's children are in his house. God don't have no outside children. So I don't care who you see going up and down the road or saying it don't matter where you go. Them ain't God's children. They have a soul that needs to be saved. Brothers and sisters, we need to make it right. First John 1, 9, James 5, 16. Why don't you do it right now while we stand, while we sing?